Welcome to another edition of NFT 101 presented by BitMart. I'm Matt Ryan. And one of the things that drew me into the world of NFTs was the art of it. And someone growing up in New York City, the art world is all around you, no matter where you live or where you're from. And today we're going to be talking about some of the greatest artists of all time and some of the greatest artworks of all time making their way into the non-fungible universe. Thomas Kerr is the president of Art Coins International and one of the minds behind Blue Chip, a brand new NFT exchange that looks to bring some of the greatest artists of all time into your wallet. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Hi there. Appreciate that, Ryan. So give us a little bit of background on ArtCoin and how we ended up uh, getting into this space to where you have all of this at your disposal. What brought you into the art, you know, not only the art space, because we were talking before we went on the air and you were talking about how when you, you and your business partners are trying to make sure that you have the best art possible. You have some war halls. Your business partner just hangs up Rothko's in his home like it's no big deal. But uh, what is the journey for ArtCoin and what is the journey? Journey to bring you guys into the NFT space? Sure. So it has to start with the family that's th that collected over 70 years of time. And the heir apparent, which is the great grandson, the grandson of the family, one day, probably about a year ago, you know, they're sort of leaning in on him saying, you know, you're going to have to curate this collection one day. And he kind of, in typical for, you know, the response for his generation says, I'm not really interested in all this stuff, but if you have an NFT of it, that might be kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so right away, it's a table flip moment for the family and say, wow, we're going to have to look into this NFT thing. And so uh, ultimately, that was the genesis of the idea to take these assets that really uh, are really part of a museum's asset uh, in the first place and a private family a foundation enabled that. And they slated a few of these high profile pieces to maybe put into the blockchain. They really believe in the blockchain to be a way for us to determine who owns what. Uh, and this idea of an immutable transaction and having an NFT was sort of a, a novel and interesting thing. But the innovation or the breakthrough for them as a group was the idea that I brought to the table that if we put an NFT out for a blue chip asset that's quite sought after and rather difficult to obtain in the first place, I thought the great idea was let's take an asset of that level, let the NFT go into the marketplace and allow that market to do price discovery in a crypto space, not a fiat space, and let that balloon ride. And the idea was that at any time that owner of the NFT flipped a secondary market, et cetera, at any time they get to run home and take the asset physically. So just think about what risks you'd take in a consequence-free environment, theoretically, that you could run and do this and kind of have the bragging rights and have this NFT in your possession. And then at one point you say, I'm done with the ride, give me my Warhol or you know, give me my Basquiat. And then you obtain the real artwork and the NFT would go back to the museum. And then of course we would burn it. So that was the driver of the innovation to do price discovery, get on a blockchain, which we chose Solana. And uh, we priced these assets, of course, in Seoul. And so we really want to see where the market will go on both the price discovery aspect and just what kind of interest there would be to have access to assets of this quality uh, in a crypto market. And some of the assets you're talking about include Mark Rothko. They include Keith Haring, Andy Warhol, Banksy involved in this collection. What is it like to basically have this gigantic swath of art, modern art history and just carrying the legacy of everything these artists have done and try to not only showcase it to a new audience, but also enable art lovers who may not have had a chance to purchase pieces like this, to give them that opportunity to not only own, own it in, in truth and then be able to have it in the digital space as well. Well, it's an awesome responsibility for these assets. Few people understand the complexities, cost, and uh, really the requirements to hold assets of this nature. Uh, my background is I ran um, eight, eight digital imaging locations in seven countries, and we specifically digitize art for the fine art trade, primarily for copyright uh, monetization and preservation and other things. And so I have been uh, for 20 years photographing artwork for the fine art trade 
And I've actually shot over a billion dollars worth of art, very high profile, both museum and private collection. And, uh, you know, you probably couldn't name a, a, an artist uh, from almost any period that I haven't photographed. And so this has sort of been part of my journey. And I joined this team with both a finance tech and art background to take the project where we took it. The blue chip strategy, of course, is the idea that people could get access to these assets, but through a blockchain auction model with a price discovery and crypto. And the idea that we think the ideal buyer who really wants to obtain the painting would be found in that manner that they know that the NFT is callable to the actual painting. And so that really was uh, the genesis moment for us to go about this. And when we look at the assets in, in its entirety, uh, we actually have 250 million in assets on the balance sheet uh, of the museum. And Artcoin can control about 150 of that. Wow. So there's $100 million worth of art assets we can't touch or won't touch for various reasons. But on the art coin level, which of course our goal is to issue a, a native cryptocurrency ourselves, uh, though it's private right now, we will put that out at some point. Blue chip was the way for us to do better price discovery and see how the NFT marketplace would give us this non-fungible token moment, as opposed to going after a blockchain play as a cryptocurrency through ICO. So we did the legal work and the research and spent some time, but our timing isn't right right now, but it is on our horizon to do it that way. Hence the certified assets and using our CPA strategy that we did to show that asset value for this purpose. What has the reaction been, not only from potential customers, but from the traditional art world? We've seen Christie's sell the most expensive NFT in history. And when it comes to art auctioning, especially, in New York City, Christie's is one of the highest peaks you can climb to. But what has been the reaction from the art community, the museum community, who would probably salivate at the idea of these assets being hung on their walls? Has there been interest from them on this side of getting involved with the NFT? Or has there been some sort of backlash like we've seen with celebrities like Ringo Starr and Madonna getting into the NFT space? Well, anytime you're bringing innovation to an industry with an establishment, you're going to create some legal tension. And certainly we felt a few early on. Um, many people initially thought maybe we're doing derivative and multiples and, and fractionalization and other existing plays in the space, but we're not doing any of the above. We are tying an NFT to the title of a physical asset. We're not conveying copyright. We're not fractionalizing. We're not doing multiples, derivatives, or any of those things. So we've had to really clear the air with a few of the foundations and work with legal folks to sort of really show how our model works. At the core of it, our business logic is codified on the smart uh, as a smart contract on the blockchain. And that's really where the key thing is to understand what we're doing at a legal level. And that's a little harder to show, but uh, anyone can see how it works by looking at our smart contract play. And so that has been really the initial foray into the space is dealing with some legal cleanup, which we anticipated. Uh, probably more exciting though, is that I think there's far more institutional players than individuals that really see these assets as, gee, we really would like access to it. And uh, I think that's probably going to be the interesting side of this play is that uh, there'll be probably some high profile folks that will win some of these auctions and will play uh, in that space with them. Um, but there are individuals, of course, who want these assets as well. So uh, we'll let the marketplace decide. And of course, that's the purpose of the auction. And I think having the NFT is going to enable people to really confidently obtain these assets and swap it out for the actual painting when they're ready. And when you look at the artists you already have on here, I'm assuming you're an art lover. You have a wish list as well. Um, there's there's an art piece for me that really speaks to the kind of weird sloppy art you see behind me if you're watching the video on YouTube, uh, some of my paintings in the background, but obviously yep. Pollock. But Marcel Duchamp is someone who <laughs> I think if, if, the NF, if he existed during the NFT space, he would probably be the most successful NFT artist of all time. It, I'm, it, I'm with you. Yeah, <laughs> Warhol too. There's certain guys that would just would have loved this as a play. I'm with you. Uh, it's interesting. I did do some work with uh, Warhol uh, group at uh, Art Basel. And at the time, it was photographs of Andy at the factory. And the big controversy at the time in the mid-2000s was that we were using inkjet to produce the actual photographs. 
And, you know, the board and, and the players and the, and the gallery directors, everybody was sort of debating all this. And in the end, everybody was telling to just pull silver gelatin traditional photographs, to which I said to the board, if Andy were alive, he'd have this studio and use inkjet. <laughs> and that really won them over when we thought about how would Andy do it. And so you're right, Ryan, some of these artists would have just loved to be alive in this time, to have this kind of spotlight, this kind of innovation and ingenuity to bring you know, tech and art and finance in sort of this uh, new discovery world. And uh, really it is uh, establishment um, uh, industries that are starting to overlap now. Um, I, I know when I left Wall Street 20 years ago, I could have never dreamed that I'd be talking to my old friends again because of the <laughs> tech finance layer of NFTs. So for me, it's kind of been a, a, a big joy on the run, putting it all together. So, And I'm here with Thomas Kerr from Artcoin and Blue Chip. When we take a look at the, the institutional investor, the people you used to work with on Wall Street, do you think their art taste will lean more towards the artists you're looking at? Your, you know, the Rothkos, the Keith Harrings, the the Andy Warhols, or do you think they're going to start floating backwards? Do you start thinking that oh, we might end up having to go into the Renaissance or go, you know, further back or you know, nineteen, you know, pre nineteen fifties and go all the way, all the way back to the what would be the advent of modern art at the dawn of the twentieth century? Well, interestingly enough, in the high net worth advisory space, which I was directly involved with with Standard & Poor's, it was always defined that, uh, you know, fine art, especially in the blue chip level, was uh, a very interesting art asset class with traditional performance of, of return that uh, many in that uh, asset holding level want exposure to. But we had such um, strict guidance on how people would acquire these assets, no more than 2% of net worth in a single acquisition, no more than 5% or up to 20% would be an aggressive category uh, allocation, which you know we had clients in the high net worth that did that. Um, so this is a really a new asset class to really compare these to, Ryan, that digital assets really are an emerging asset class, and an important one at that. And I think that in terms of its performance and where it will go, uh, the fact that there's now sort of a bridge between traditional art and uh, NF NFT as a digital asset is an interesting play here for that advisory space and high net worth of people that would want this exposure. So there is some a certain uh, migration toward more risk and more interest in the digital space because of it. Do you think that uh, platforms like Artcoin and Blue Chip will serve as incubators for young artists as well? We're seeing a lot of digital artists go into the NFT space, and a lot of them are kind of flying blind or trying to learn the dichotomy of being a creator and a business person. As someone who works in the art and worked in the finance world, do you feel Artcoin and Blue Chip and other firms can position themselves as the institutional key for a lot of these young artists being fast? because this could be the next step because we we know that a lot of artists have patrons and is this the next level of patronage in art well i think you're on to it ryan um i think we saw through things like instagram and social media some um disintermediation of gallerists and galleries where they held all the power and i've worked with thousands of artists over the years many emerging and, and middle mid-career folks and they're always targeting, oh, I want to get in this gallery or that gallery. There's always been some resistance friction to get uh, into a gallery. And so that got disintermediated through social media. And we saw some rising stars happen because of that more open market architecture as opposed to being more controlled by galleries. So I think the same play is going to happen out with NFT in terms of discovery. I would look at Beeple, of course, you know, really wasn't looking for fine art uh, spotlight. And yet here he is giving us the high watermark. So he's a perfect case study for what the possibility is. Uh, many artists do love the idea of sharing their art and having a broader base of, of geography and, and diversity, all these elements. And the NFT space really is giving you a much broader uh, uh, experience and audience for, for an artist. And so many artists have embraced it. It is more complex. I remember minting my first NFT almost two years ago. It was so complex, I had to go to two locations to deal with 
Web3 wallet integration to the artist. And, you know, it was like landing a plane without the landing gear, right? And so we got it done and the flames didn't, you know, get us. But I just look at it uh, and how it's evolving. Now today on our platform, though not open to the public for our own assets, we can mint an NFT for, you know, hundreds of a penny in a matter of minutes. And so that's just two years time of compression from being very difficult to almost uh, easy and, and, and almost no cost. So all that, you know, friction's going away and it's facilitating uh, more and more participants. And so that will continue to happen. I think our probably our biggest challenge today is the fact that the Web3 world is still being debated and criticized somewhat. And self-custody is an enormous responsibility for anything that has value, whether it be cryptocurrency or an NFT. And not everybody's ready for that. They have to understand that a self-custody wallet managing this has some uh, degree of responsibility that they must take seriously. And so those are other friction points. So we may see some custody and custodial plays that you know reduce those risks. We may see some sort of uh, uh, collectives that can do things for you uh, in aggregate and not force too much responsibility on yourself. And many artists do like the idea of being productive as an artist and not have too much back end office overhead to deal with to run their art businesses. And I think that's very natural for an artist to look for some sort of affinity, uh, such as a gallerist for their physical painting and finding some sort of NFT collaborative. As far as our platform is, we do have a strict business model that uh, we are only minting our own assets at this juncture, though there's plenty of discussion of opening up our business model in the future. When we talk to a lot of folks at Solana and some of the venture capital world that we've touched upon, there was a, a fairly consistent, uh, what about us? Can we come to your platform moment, which we were very encouraged by. Um, uh, so what we did in our smart contract is we have a 1% uh, uh, distribution back to Solana's foundation to help artists get access to NFT and kind of help out on a revenue side. And certainly uh, as a platform, we, we encourage people to look at what we're doing and how we're tethering and how we built our smart contract and Rust to give this ability uh, guarantee to an NFT holder. And we think that it will play out in other segments. We just happen to be dealing with really a blue chip level, which is loosely defined 100,000 up and really household brand names here, as you saw on our uh, minting site. And so that's where we're at today. That's subject to change down the road. But the here and now is we have a fairly exclusive blue chip only platform. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. And final question to you. What's the one piece in this collection that you wish deep down inside was the one that was hanging up on your wall out of the ones that are available now. And then let us know uh, where we can find blue chip and art coin across social media. Obviously you can see it in the link in the description below. If you're listening to the audio or video platform, uh, we've got the links in there for you to find blue chip, but let the people know. Well, you know, as a collector over 30 years, um, I'm new to the urban street art scene. Uh, I've got a lot of conceptual art, a lot of California artists I've collected. Um, but um, I obtained um, one of the Mr. Brainwash uh, fairly recently, and it kind of got me into that vibe, like, what else can I go after? And of course, we have the Basquiat X-ray piece here at the museum, which I photographed for them. And I get to spend some time with the piece, and I get to tell you, I'm bonded with it at this point. <laughs> so there's your answer, one of the Basquiat's. Of course, we have three Basquiat's in the museum, but uh, this particular X-ray is really an amazing piece. And I have shot other Basquiat's for private collectors. Uh, and this one is just uh, such a fabulous uh, example of his work. Uh, so that would be your answer. But if you want to learn more about Blue Chip, if you want to learn more about ArtCoin, Thomas, where can we find it? And if you're on social media, where can we find you? Yeah, so uh, bluechipnft.co is the best place to go, and you'll see our social media links down there uh, for Twitter and Instagram and others. And so that's really our core platform. You can check out some of the assets. are kind of cool just to go through. We happen to have some really interesting pre-Columbian art pieces up there right now. And, uh, you know, these are 300 BC <laughs> items and uh, they're beautifully photographed. So you can see the textures and the qualities. And they're really something to see, something that you typically only see in a museum. You can go zoom right in and check it all out. Hope people will do that. Well, thank you so much, Thomas Kerr from ArtCoin and Blue Chip for joining us here on NFT 101. Hopefully as the collection grows or as the NFT art space continues to grow, we can have you back on to talk art. This has been a fun talk. 
Anytime, Ryan. You're a rock star. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Have a great one. This has been you NFT did. 101. Nathan here from BitMart. Hope you liked that conversation. I know that I always do. It's great learning more about crypto and kind of putting a face behind all the technical jargon. But that's not the last thing we have to do. We've got to get some legal stuff out of the way. And so here it goes. All opinions and actions expressed and undertaken by the hosts and guests are individual opinions and actions and do not reflect the views and actions of BitMart. BitMart does not guarantee the accuracy, applicability, reliability, integrity, performance, completeness, or appropriateness of this content. The value of digital currencies can go up or down, and there can be a substantial risk in buying, selling, holding, or investing in digital currencies. You should carefully consider whether trading or holding digital currencies is suitable for you based on your personal investment objectives, financial circumstances, and risk tolerance. BitMart does not provide investment, tax, or legal advice. Use of BitMart services is entirely at your own risk.